So this is the story of, of at least two people. One was Deborah Sykes, uh, who was the victim here, and Daryl Hunt, who was the one who was wrongfully convicted of her rape and murder. So the story begins here on West End Boulevard, uh, near downtown, just a block or two from downtown Winston-Salem. Deborah Sykes worked as a copy editor at the Winston-Salem Sentinel. Uh, that newspaper went out of business just a few years after uh, her death. She was uh, usually parking either on this side behind Crystal Towers Apartments or on the other so side, which is closer to downtown. Why she chose to park on West End on that morning, we'll never know. But she did park on West End, which is right near a set of uh, an open area. There is a uh, power station on the other side of the trees today. Uh, there's a, like a little park area, as you can see around me here. She was uh, grabbed. Uh, by her attacker, and she was dragged somehow into the uh, into the woods away from where the uh, street is and where she could be, where they could be seen. We know that she and her attacker fought pretty substantially. There was trampled grass around uh, the site here. Uh, her clothing and possessions were strewn about the place uh, pretty broadly, as well. And we know that he attacked her with a pocket knife. Apparently he didn't have anything else handy uh, and had decided to do so because he didn't, I guess he didn't expect her to resist. Um, so he used a pocket knife that was, uh, according to the medical examiner, uh, a fairly small bladed knife. And uh, the uh, attacker stabbed her at least 19 times, including uh, puncturing her heart, which is what the lethal blow was, uh, that caused a loss of blood and caused caused her death. Uh, she, that was sometime between her death was sometime between 6:30 and 7 on an August morning in 1984. Her supervisor realized she hadn't shown up to work. Uh, the supervisor called her husband, who actually came up here to Winston Salem uh, by roughly nine o'clock. A bystander found the body not long after that and called the police. So within just a very short number of hours, within a few hours, uh, the police were on scene here uh, and processing uh, the, the crime scene. This is important, as we'll see later, in the interpretation of the forensic serology, which was a key element of the evidence in this case. So uh, what they found was that she had been uh, raped. They found uh, that uh, there was biological fluid that they collected uh, uh, vag from around the vaginal area, from, uh, they, they took a sample from the anal area. At autopsy, found they took what is called a vaginal aspirate as well. All three of those samples showed a significant fraction of uh, sperm, so they had a fairly high concentration of semen in it, which was also relevant. As you might imagine, a, a young white woman uh, uh, raped and murdered near downtown was a fairly sensational event at the time. The police uh, went all out to try to find out what had happened. Uh, even then, it was recognized that the Winston-Salem police were not up to the task. Uh, in 1986, just a couple of years after the murder, the town administrator issued a report talking about how shoddy the police investigation was in this case. Nonetheless, they did interview an awful lot of witnesses, and there were some key witnesses. One of them was a bail bondsman. A couple of blocks uh, away from downtown, the bail bondsman had come across Mr. Darrell Hunt and a, a friend of his by the name of Sammy Mitchell. And so uh, Hunt and Mitchell were placed near here on the night before the murders, somewhere around 2 or 3 a.m. on the night before the murders. Uh, there was also, there are several hotels in downtown, of course, and there were at that time, there was a uh, hotel employee who says that he saw an African-American man come into the lobby that uh, morning, uh, not long after when the murder had occurred. Uh, that man uh, spent an awful lot of time in the men's room. After he left, the employee went back into the hotel to see, into the bathroom to see what had happened. 
and he found uh, pinkish uh, watery liquid in the sink and found bloody towels in the, in the trash can. The weird thing about that was he did not report that immediately to the police, as you might expect. He only uh, did so when he uh, saw a picture of Daryl Hunt in the newspaper months later. And he said, oh, that must be connected and called the police and said, yeah, Daryl Hunt, I'm sure I saw him. And so the ID in that case was, was if, if you know anything about eyewitness identification, that was a very shaky ID to say the least. To say, you know, months later that you're going to connect somebody, it could easily have been the power of suggestion of seeing Mr. Hunt's picture in the newspaper and then just deciding, well, that's the guy I saw. In any case, that was also a witness uh, against Hunt at his trial. The star witness, if you can call him that, was a man by the name of Thomas Murphy. And Murphy was the kind of guy who followed the police around during the investigation, wanted to be a part of the action, that kind of thing. Uh, he was also, and this of course goes to his credibility, a former member, and I'm not kidding you about this, of the Ku Klux Klan. So you can legitimately ask, right? Is this a guy who, uh, can you, you know, you can take the man out of the clan, but can you take the clan out of the man, right? So is this a, a credible witness? I think most people today would say that would not be a very credible witness, especially with the way that some of his accounts vary. But at trial, what he said against Daryl Hunt was that he saw a uh, black man and a white woman. The black man was pulling the white woman over into the bushes and that there was another black man who he said he saw looking out from the bushes at, at things as that happened. So uh, then he positively identified Daryl Hunt as the man who was pulling the woman into the forest. And he identified this guy by the name of Johnny Gray um, who was all, who was connected to Mr. Hunt as an associate uh, uh, from before, and so uh, Murphy said Gray was the guy who was who was hiding in the in the bushes, and so uh, uh, implicated both of them in the uh, rape murder. Gray wound up testifying against Hunt as well, uh, and and then there was there was other things that happened at the time too. One of al one of the alibis that Daryl Hunt pushed forward initially was that he was at a Motel 6 with a young woman who actually wound up being underage when he was first arrested. He was actually arrested not for this incident, not for this crime, but for statutory rape of her. So he, that alibi wound up working against him. Uh, and she wound up testifying also in the trial. Uh, her testimony was very poorly handled by the prosecution and by the court. And that actually wound up, even though he was convicted at the 1985 trial, that conviction was eventually overturned in 1989. He was retried in 1990 for this offense and wound up being reconvicted again. Uh, this time they handled that witness testimony a little better. But in both trials, they presented the serology. And what was interesting about that aspect of it is that the serology was handled uh, very, very poorly. So as I said, there were these three samples that were collected uh, from the victim, and all of the samples had a significant amount of semen in them. So there were two main ways that the uh, uh, analyst at the North Carolina State Board of, in of, of Investigation, uh, NCSBI in Raleigh, uh, used. And these were standard methods at the time. So one was uh, acid phosphatase, and acid phosphatase is uh, found at very high levels in male semen. It's found at very low levels in vaginal fluid, and therefore it can be questioned as to whether the presence of acid phosphatase is, a, is an absolutely definitive indicator that the uh, sample includes uh, enough semen so that the male fraction should be seen. The other more definitive technique that was used was microscopic uh, examination of the, of the uh, uh, samples. So uh, basically what, you, what, would, what the analyst did was to take the swab, uh, one of the vaginal swabs that were sampled, 
uh, sme smeared it across a microscope slide, used what is called a Christmas tree stain, which is still used in forensic labs today. It helps to visualize the sperm and found for the, uh, for the uh, uh, vaginal swab, uh, what is called light to moderate sperm is what she said at that time. And what that uh, means now, we would normally today and even at that time have used a numerical semi-quantitative index. <laughs> we would normally at that time have, would have used a normal, um, at that time and today, uh, a semi-quantitative index would have been used. And so it would have gone plus one, plus two, three, and four uh, to uh, be an indicator of kind of what the concentration of this spermatozoa was. So four is basically uh, pure uh, semen and fresh. And one would be there is uh, a male part of male fraction of semen in the sample, but it was fairly dilute. Uh, she said light to moderate. The, the, there were two different examiners and there's two, two different trials, uh, but they both said the same thing. They said it was a light to moderate level of the uh, uh, spermatozoa seen on the microscope slides. I interpret that to mean two or three. It doesn't even matter in that sense. What that means is the male fraction should have been seen in the uh, serology. And this is really, really important. The victim was a type O secretor um, with, uh, uh, and there were other markers, there were two other markers looked at, one PGM and the other peptidase A. Uh, she was a PGM2 and a peptidase A1. The biological fluid matched her perfectly. It was also showing uh, blood group substances from a type O secretor like the victim and PGM2 and peptidase 1. And so the NCSBI analyst uh, basically said, well, all I'm seeing is stuff from the victim, therefore I can't say anything about who the assailant was. And that would be valid testimony if it weren't for the fact that the, uh, especially the uh, 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 vaginal swab was was based on what had happened at the crime scene here, what was reported about it, what was seen in the smear, uh, showed that it was probably pretty close to uh, uh, mostly semen. And therefore, the male uh, attacker, uh, sh uh, uh, his serology should have been reflected in the sample. And why do I go on about that? Because Daryl Hunt, his blood type was type B. And so they had to explain away the fact that there were no B blood group substances found in the serology in any of the samples that were taken from the victim. Okay, I'd like to take a closer look at the forensic serology now, including taking a look at some of the testimony that occurred in this case. So just as a recap above me here, you'll see the uh, rape kit samples which included H antigens, that's just another word for the blood group substances that are associated with a type O secretor, it's just another word for it, uh, PGM2 and peptidase A type 1, uh, high acid phosphatase, and enough microscopic spermatozoa that it's clear that it was a large fraction of it was uh, from a male contributor, if not the majority of it. The victim matched that precisely. We don't know the full uh, profile of the assailant. We do know that he was an O secretor though. So he matched it at least in that way precisely. And I'd bet a dollar and a half that he matched every last aspect of that sample and was the primary contributor to all that spermatozoa that was seen in it. And of course, Daryl Hunt did not match. He was a type B secretor. Uh, he actually uh, was a PGM-1. So those two markers did not match the crime scene sample. And as a result, the prosecution and the police and oddly, the Forensic Science Laboratory, the North Carolina Bureau, uh, State Bureau of Investigation had to explain away the fact that this was clearly exculpatory serology and he should never have been even brought to trial. He should have been released immediately upon seeing this exculpatory serology result. So here's the 1985 trial transcript, uh, just saying specifically, did you see sperm in both the sample from the anus and the vaginal cavity? So saying yes, there was a third sample of uh, vaginal aspirate taken at the autopsy that also showed uh, significant levels of uh, spermatozoa. So there was plenty of male contributor in all of the forensic samples. So here is uh, some a rundown. This was uh, Daryl Hunt showing Daryl Hunt's uh, 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 
uh, profile. Uh, he was a B secretor, PGM-1, uh, showing the uh, different, uh, there's several different other systems that were tested as the reference sample. That's not really relevant because those weren't tested in the sexual assault kit sample, but it shows, yes, they did a full uh, 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 examination of his uh, reference sample against all of these systems, even though they weren't always successful. And that's, that's to be expected in getting those uh, systems to work on crime scene samples. So uh, then the question then is, does this completely rule him out as putting semen inside uh, the victim? And so, and the answer here, this is the first time where I feel like this is a, a misrepresentation, a false and misleading representation of what the serology says. The answer being no, it would not. Would it absolutely say that he did it? Well, absolutely no, it would never. The serology never was specific enough to do that although it was not uncommon, and in some instances you can see that it might have been done by the Winston-Salem police, for them to say, well, you know, the uh, uh, victim was, uh, uh, the, the, the sexual assault kit sample showed this, so we can place him at the, at the scene of the crime based on the serology. That was always nonsense, because the serology was never good enough to do that. And so, you know, even type B, if the type B antigens have been seen in the samples, is about 10% of the population or so. And so millions of people could uh, uh, meet that, uh, unlike DNA today, which can be specifically saying, okay, this individual contributed to this sample, or is maybe even the only sole contributor to the sample. It's a very different thing. Um, and so, uh, but here, this was downright a, a misinterpretation at best, uh, where uh, instead of saying, yeah, he was, he was excluded, instead said, no, 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 we, we really don't know anything. According to the results I obtained, obtained I can only say uh, that they were the same as the victim. I can't say anything more about it. This, again, is, is incorrect because we know the sperm didn't come from the victim. The sperm had to come from the assailant. There was a significant male fraction, um, roughly plus two or plus three, semi quantitatively, uh, in, that, in that sample. Would the fact that her body wasn't found for a, a number of hours contributed to it? So remember, I mentioned that the body was found just a few hours after she was murdered. This is really, really important. Bacteria. This. So what she's saying here is the bacteria probably attacks uh, the the uh, the blood group substances. Probably attack the B antigens from uh, uh, Mr. Hunt, and that's why we didn't see them. So again, the, it's not consistent with her prior statement. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, they're trying another ex explanation, throwing something else out there to try to explain away the exculpatory serology results and say, well, maybe bacteria ate them all. And, and it isn't uh, unheard of. That can happen, but not in just a few hours. Bacteria don't do magic. They can uh, uh, digest samples. It's one of the reasons why of uh, uh, sexual assault kit samples and other uh, samples from crime scenes, the first thing that is done is that they are dry. It's why there's no such thing as a, as a perfect quantitative assay uh, in this case. You, you, because you've already eliminated all the volatile organic compounds, the water and other things that uh, come off when the samples are dried, and, and therefore the sample that goes to the crime lab isn't a perfect representation of all the different things that were going on uh, at the crime scene. It's, it's by necessity because you would have bacterial contamination. If, you're, if it's sitting for days and months uh, in a wet state, uh, uh, out and especially if it's set uh, uh, at room temperature, then you will have bacterial growth and it will destroy uh, the the sample basically and make it unusable. But to say the same thing is going to happen in just a few hours uh, that uh, the victim was was laying in the park there is absurd. That is a misrepresentation. It, that does not happen. It wasn't like the body was in a swamp or anything of that nature. It was a perfectly normal situation. The, uh, there's no reason to believe that it was, it was, there was the conditions were sufficient enough to um, uh, uh, destroy the blood group substances. And so that's another uh, basically lie, if you want to put it uncharitably, uh, that was done by the examiner uh, in this trial. So what blood was the defendant? He was a B secretor. Again, this is just reinforcing this. They had to explain all this away. He doesn't match. He doesn't match. There was a male contributor in the uh, sexual assault sample, and he ain't there. Where did he go? And so um, uh, pretty pretty clear. She she says she found spermatozoa here. Uh, uh, you know, as I as I show here in my chart, and 
Uh, but but no, he, he wasn't in the sample at all. He was, he was clearly excluded. And the other issue that comes up in these kinds of cases a lot, uh, especially with an indigent defendant, is inadequate defense. Now, I don't want to cast a first against this lawyer too much because uh, one of the uh, defense lawyers in his case worked for 20 years, basically, to help to exonerate him, really worked hard to try to help Mr. Hunt. And so it's not that uh, I'm attacking them particularly. But the fact of the matter is they didn't understand the serology, and they really didn't work to challenge these misinterpretations the way they should have in either trial, either the 1985 trial or the retrial in 1990. Uh, here's a good example of this. First two, this is actually from the transcript, uh, first two opportunities to do cross-examination, they said no questions. And then Mr. Yates, who was the prosecutor, decided he was going to ask a few more questions uh, regardless. And, uh, and that's the only reason that the defense had any opportunity to do any kind of cross-examination. And that's really unfortunate because a good cross-examination really was warranted in this case. But, you know, it was possible the examiner would never have gotten any cross, which would, which, and uh, I don't think anybody looking at this uh, as an expert uh, uh, in the law or in forensic science would find that acceptable. Uh, at the very least, those interpretations that were given about the uh, uh, serology interpretation about bacterial contamination should be challenged uh, on cross-examination, ideally with a second expert, really, because that's how strong this uh, serology was. The serology really was very, very exculpatory. So, uh, so in, and here is the, the thinking. I think this is actually from the 90 trial. So uh, I do not actually know how much semen and how much vaginal fluid is present Therefore, I can't predict whether I should be able to detect anything from the semen. There might be small amount of vaginal fluid and a large amount of semen. There might be vice versa. Uh, you know, she's basically hand waving it around. Saying, ah, I don't really know how much semen there was in there. And so, you know, you know, if I had a quantitative way of determining that, maybe I could say something, but I can't. But that's BS, to be per perfectly honest. She had microscopic uh, smears. Uh, that are accepted as appropriate semi-quantitative metrics of whether there's a male fraction present. And that should have been sufficient to say that, hey, his blood group substances should have been there, but they were not. So, um, so here is an, a, another, another thing. This is also from the 1990 trial, actually. So well, everything that was known, in other words, did you perform a DNA test on this? So this is, there, this is by the time, by this time, DNA wasn't common, but it, it was known in the, in the field. And say that no, no, they didn't do DNA testing in 1984. But actually, this is again a misrepresentation. I don't know about um, all of the ins and outs of what was shared with the defense in the 1990 trial, but I do know that there was a DNA test in 1989. There wasn't one before the per first trial, but there was one in 1989 before the second trial. And so this answer is evasive at the very, uh, very least. Um, so it's very um, uh, questionable to, be, to have been asked about DNA testing and then say, well, in 1984, we didn't do DNA testing, uh, but we just happened to last year. They clearly did DNA testing with the hope that they would inculpate Daryl Hunt. The DNA testing wasn't successful. What was interesting about this isn't just that it wasn't successful, because obviously that was neither going to be inculpatory or exculpatory for the test isn't successful, but there's another aspect to it, and that is that the standard practice then and the standard practice now is you start with the defer deferential extraction and quantitation. In other words, you separate the male and the female parts of the sample um, because you are tr you're, you're looking for in sexual assault evidence to to profile the male uh, uh, contributor, and you and you do a quantitation: how much male DNA is there? How much is that male? How much of that male contributor is there, so that you can you do the polymerase chain reaction correctly, or whatever other method you're using? In this case, they wouldn't have been using PCR because it was too early in the history of DNA for them and the technology to have done so. But they had uh, both uh, an idea. They had an idea from that work how much of a male contributor there was. They could have done some immunoassays at that point, and uh, and perhaps uh, come up with a a, a determination of what the pure male contributor was. They didn't attempt a differential extraction for any purpose other than to see whether they could make a DNA result that was inculpatory to Mr. Hunt work. Again, uh, not only apparently failing to do a full job on the forensic science, 
apparently not sharing with the defense that this DNA test had occurred, and thirdly, misrepresenting in trial testimony that uh, uh, the, the DNA testing had even been done, had it, had be, even been attempted by using this evasive answer that in the original trial, they didn't do DNA testing. That's uh, gross. That's a gross misrepresentation again. So uh, I want to talk to this about because there is another uh, aspect of this, and that is P30 testing. So P30 is another word for uh, PSA, if you, uh, the, the prostate-specific antigen. PSA testing, of course, is very common today. It was developed uh, mostly in the 70s by uh, folks that are from biomedicine and from forensic science. As you might imagine, it's a pretty useful tool in forensic science because it's male-specific. And so it was, it, was, it was developed for cases in which you didn't have spermatozoa. And, uh, and so if you, so you wanted to see whether there was a male fraction, but you didn't have spermatozoa, for whatever reason, the, the male wasn't producing uh, a sperm, uh, then you could still detect that there was a male fraction there using P PSA or P30, as the terminology is, in forensic science. Here again, you have a misrepresentation. I have to say that particular methodology hasn't really been accepted throughout the United States as being an accurate prediction of whether or not the typing test that you obtain can be attributed to vaginal material or semen. This was said in 1990, a full five years after this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was a landmark paper laying out how uh, that particular test would be done, why it is accurate, how it should be done, uh, the Serological Research Institute and others had established standards. It was very well established that P30 could be used to look at this issue of how much male contrib contribution there was to a serological sample. And there were methods to do a, what I would call a semi-quantitative assay. Again, because you're looking at dried samples, there's nothing perfect about it. But there were standards for you know how much you would, would need to have in order to say that you uh, would see a male male contributor. And, gen and, and those ratio the ratios uh, were varied from uh, 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 over the, uh, a little bit, but it was either one to 100 or one to 200 and that range. If you had 1% or 0.5%, you assume that there was a sufficient male fraction to be able to say that uh, uh, you would be able to see the serological markers. Well, in this case, the samples were probably close to 50% well more than that threshold uh, in any case. Uh, but the examiner nonetheless was, was misrepresenting the case of the science. Uh, by this point in history, in 1990, uh, uh, it was five years since the seminal paper in, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So They attempted DNA analysis in 1989, before the 1990 trial, but the technology really hadn't uh, developed by that time. I suppose the prosecutors thought if they could get DNA to back up that it was Hunt, that they would have been able to use that in the second trial. Cellmark, however, which was the contractor who attempted the DNA analysis, wasn't able to get a profile using the technology of the time. After his 1990 conviction, there was another attempt in 1994, this time using modern PCR techniques. And PCR, that allows the analyst to multiply the DNA many, many times over, so even a small amount of DNA, you could actually get a profile nonetheless. And in fact, they did get a profile using the markers available at the time. DQ Alpha was one. Several others were also obtained from the evidence, and they compared that to Daryl Hunt and several of the other people who were suspects, but not not Brown, who was the actual uh, assailant. Uh, they never they never checked him in 1994 because I guess by that time he was completely off the radar screen. The 1994 DNA analysis completely exonerated Daryl Hunt. He did not match the crime scene samples in any way, shape, or form. This was explained away by the prosecution and by the courts as saying, well, you know, maybe somebody else contributed those markers. Maybe there was another rapist. Maybe Hunt murdered her but didn't rape her or maybe there were two rapists and that kind of thing. He was actually convicted of murder, not of rape. And therefore, it actually went all the way to the North Carolina Supreme Court, and they said, well, it's not relevant anyway. So there was another guy. We always knew there was another guy in the bushes. Maybe he was the one whose markers were seeing. And so they refused to release 
uh, Daryl Hunt at that time, especially because the DNA techniques couldn't identify somebody. They weren't strong enough, and there was no DNA database. They, uh, they weren't strong enough to identify somebody you know, out of all the people in the world or say, or make a cold hit or anything of that nature. You just couldn't, the technology just couldn't do it at the time. And so, and they were able to explain away, again, the fact that this black man they felt was guilty and they weren't gonna let him go unless they really had something very, very compelling, other than the fact that the serology was exonerating and the DNA was exonerating. I don't know what else you need, right? So he stayed in prison for another 10 years, roughly. In early 2003, a judge ordered the North Carolina State Board of Investigation to do another DNA profile. This time, again, DNA technology had improved. This time, there were STR markers that could identify somebody, even somebody uniquely out of the entire population of the Earth. There was a DNA database, but the NCSBI dragged their feet for months. Only in, at the end of 2003, when the judge uh, told them that he would hold the crime lab in contempt, did they actually do the DNA analysis. And at that time, they again, exonerated Daryl Hunt. This time though, they found somebody, not who was the actual perpetrator, uh, Willard Brown, but actually one of his relatives. And uh, this time, an astute investigator did some digging and found the relationship between that person and the and, and the relative who was in the relative who was in the database and Willard Brown, the actual perpetrator, looked up the old cases that showed that Brown had been implicated potentially in the rape here in downtown um, uh, uh, Winston Salem, the the Lane rape and put two and two together and realized that this was probably the guy. They got his DNA uh, from a cigarette butt in Georgia and it matched perfectly. Brown was arrested. He immediately confessed when he was being booked. Uh, didn't even, didn't need an inter interrogation or anything else like that. He immediately confessed to the rape murder of Deborah Sykes. And then finally, at that point, when they had another African-American man who had actually confessed and said he had worked alone, that finally Daryl Hunt was officially uh, released and exonerated. He received a gubernatorial pardon after that and compensation from uh, North Carolina in exchange for dropping any lawsuit. He wound up becoming an advocate for the wrongfully convicted uh, a very well respected and noted uh, advocate for the wrongfully convicted. For the remainder of his life, he wound up uh, uh, contracting uh, a, a, a disease here in recent years and committing suicide in 2017. So he has now uh, passed away. Uh, the uh, last victim of uh, Willard Brown and the Winston Salem uh, uh, criminal justice system. Uh, so Deborah Sykes was a victim, um, uh, Daryl Hunt was a victim, the other uh, victims of, of Brown are also uh, victims in that regard. There are a lot of people who suffered uh, uh, terribly as a result of the missteps in this case. The failure to recognize the exculpatory serology, the shoddy police work generally, the failure to recognize the exculpatory DNA in the post-conviction phase, these all added up as well as many, many other items. I'm gonna attach a link to the investigation that the city of Winston-Salem eventually did in the 2000s into the case and all of the circumstances. It's extremely well documented and so you can see for yourself if you have an interest, if you're curious, to look more deeply into this case and all, all that went into it, both in the forensic science side, all the forensic science reports are actually in, in the uh, documentation, as well as all the witnesses and the court decisions and that kind of thing. Truly a tragedy for Mr. Hunt, but a great lesson as well for those of us who are looking at it from the point of view of 2023, because the issues that we see with respect to uh, experts who can get it wrong, who can fail, either because they're using a technique that isn't necessarily well-suited or powerful enough in terms of its uh, uh, statistical value or its scientific uh, strength, uh, or because they themselves have decided that they're going to be biased by their colleagues, 
uh, perhaps by racial bias, whatever else it would be, this can happen in forensic science, it can happen in other expert disciplines as well. It's extraordinarily uh, sad, it's deplorable that this is what has ha what happened to, to Mr. Hunt and all the other victims in this case. I hope that this was a story that was valuable to you in terms of learning about what, uh, what can happen in these situations and the factors across the system in the police, in the prosecution, the courts, the forensic science, all these people working together and working together in this case towards what was sadly an unjust result for nearly 20 years in Winston-Salem.